Shalom and welcome, brothers and sisters. Yom HaTeruah falls on the first day of Rosh Hodesh, of the seventh biblical month. It is translated alternatively as the day of shouting, or the day of trumpets. The rabbis call it Rosh Hashanah, or the Jewish New Year, though this interpretation has no support whatsoever in the Hebrew scriptures in Tanakh. Yom HaTeruah is mentioned only twice in the Torah. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, we read, Speak to the children of Israel and say, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, shall be for you a day of rest, a remembrance through noise-making, zikaron teruah, in Hebrew. A holy convocation, Yom HaTeruah, is mentioned once again, and for the last time, in Numbers chapter 29, verse 1. So what is this elusive holy day holiday mentioned only twice throughout the Torah, and so unclear that the rabbis felt compelled to give it the extra meaning of the Jewish New Year? The key to understanding Yom HaTeruah is to understand the full implication of the two words, the two words, which occur in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, remembrance, zikaron in Hebrew, and noise-making, teruah. Teruah in Hebrew, noise-making, the concept of teruah is found many times throughout the Tanakh, in the Hebrew scriptures, and is not necessarily connected to the making of noise on the shofar, as tradition holds. In Numbers chapter 10, verse 5, we see that the teruah is a loud blast on the silver trumpets, for example. That's in Numbers chapter 10, verse 5. Used to signal the movement of the camps of Israel in the desert. Likewise, in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, we see that Israel is commanded to make a loud blast, teruah, on the silver trumpets when going out to war. And you shall be remembered... Before Yehoah, your Elohim, your God, and saved from your enemies. We notice something very interesting about the verse I just read. By making a loud blast, teruah in Hebrew, on the silver trumpets, we are remembered before Yehoah, our Elohim, and as we read Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, Yom ha teruah is also called a remembrance, the remembrance of Yehoah, our Creator, through noise-making, zikaron teruah. Therefore, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9, is the second time in the Torah that we see a connection between noise-making, teruah, and remembrance, zikaron. We will return to this very important point below um, that I just read. But let us first explore more uses of teruah and zikaron. We also see in Exodus chapter 3, when God speaks to Moshe, he says, this is my remembrance. That's what the word is there again, to be remembered. It doesn't mean just to remember by your mind, but remembering by speaking as well. So it can also mean to speak and to remember. So remembrance is not just remembering, because a lot of people will say for the name of God, that when it says, this is my name forever, le'olam in Hebrew, but also remembrance, they say, remember here, do not speak. No, it also means to speak. Just wanted to point that out. Perhaps one of the most famous uses of the word teruah comes from the story of Yehoshua, or Joshua, and the walls of Jericho. After an elaborate six-day ritual in which the Kohanim priests circled the walls with the Ark of the Covenant, blasting on the shofar, and the people joined them but remained silent, on the seventh day, the Kohanim circled the walls six times, and then on the seventh time, the people shouted, and the Kohanim blew the shofar. And when the people heard the sound of the shofars, they shouted, so people focus on the blowing of the shofar, but ignore the next part, that they shouted afterwards. A great shout, teruah 
Gedolah in Hebrew. And the wall came tumbling down, and the people went up into the city. This is in Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. Other places where Teruah appears are, for example, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 5. The Ark of the Covenant is brought out to the battle against the Philistines, accompanied by a great shout, Teruah Gedolah in Hebrew, from the people. The Ark is then captured by the Philistines and brought to Ashdod. In the second Samuel, second Samuel chapter 6, verse 15, King David and the entire house of Israel bring the Ark up to the city of David in Jerusalem with shouting, Teruah, again, and the sound of the shofar. So there's shouting and the shofar. People focus on the shofar and not the shouting. So I'm having you open your eyes to not just in your ears, not just to the shofar, but the focus of the loud noise making, the shouting. That's in Psalms chapter 81, verse 2. It says there, Sing to the God of our strength. Shout, ha Riu in Hebrew. From the same root as Teruah, unto the God of Jacob. And in Psalms 100, verse 1, we read, Shout, Hariyu in Hebrew, until or unto Yehoah, all the earth. In summary, and now Zikaron, the idea of being remembered by Yehoah can be seen extensively throughout the Torah. And a couple of examples will help us put this into focus. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, after Noah had been floating in the ark for 150 days, the Torah says, And Yehoah remembered Noah and all the wild and domesticated animals which were with him on the ark. And Yehoah caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters diminished. Had Yehoah really forgotten about Noah? Of course not. Rather, the word remembrance when applied to Yehoah, implies the deliberate turning of Yehoah's attention toward a particular individual or group at a certain point in time, often in order to pay him back for some good or bad that he has done in the past. In this case, in particular, Yehoah is turning his attention towards Noah and remembering him for the fact that he was righteous in his generations. We see this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Likewise, in Genesis chapter 19, verse 29, when Yehoah destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, he remembers Avraham, our father, and therefore saves his nephew Lot. And Yehoah, it says, remembered Abraham and sent Lot out from the destruction when he overturned the cities in which Lot dwelled. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 22, Yehoah remembers the barren Rachel and provides her with her first son, Joseph. And Yehoah remembered, again, remembered Rachel and hearkened to her and opened her womb. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 24, Yehoah remembers, i.e. turns his attention to the covenant with our forefathers and begins the process by which ultimately our people are freed from slavery in Egypt. And Yehoah heard there the children of Israel groaning, and Yehoah remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And Yehoah took notice of the children of Israel, and Yehoah knew. So we see that gaining the attention or remembrance of Yehoah is a common concept throughout the Tanakh. There are many more examples. And we saw earlier in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, that one of the ways to gain his remembrance is by making loud noise, teruah, i.e. calling out to him, and also through the shofar. But why do we need to gain Yehoah's remembrance specifically on the first day of the seventh biblical month? Why is that? Tying it all together, the case of the half shekel. In Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, Moses is commanded to collect a half shekel of silver from every Israelite who is counted during a census. So everyone who passes through the census shall give a half shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty geras is the shekel. A half shekel as a donation to Yehoah 
verse 13, what is the purpose of the collection of this half shekel? Verses 16 through 17 tells us explicitly, And you shall take this money of atonement, kipurim, from the children of Israel, and it shall be for the children of Israel as a remembrance, zikaron, before Yehoah to atone for your souls. So by giving the half shekel during the census count, we are remembered before Yehoah, and when he remembers us, he grants us atonement. Why we need atonement for our souls during a census count is a story in and of itself. A whole nother, because someone will take that and run with it, of course, because it's convenient. But suffice to say that throughout the Tanakh, taking a census is closely associated with going out to war. That's the point of the message, the context. A time of high danger when it is best that our souls be clear of any negative karma. The key point here is that Yehovah's remembrance of us leads to his granting us to atonement and remembering us as well. So we remember him, he remembers us. And as we saw earlier, shouting out to Yehovah or with a shofar leads to his remembrance of us. So tying it all together, we have the following equation or conclusion. Teruah, noise making, zikaron, remembrance, kippur, atonement. Yom ha teruah, in context, one of the fundamental tenets of Karite analysis of the Torah itself is contextual analysis, very careful study. And this is what a lot of ones that watch don't understand. Nothing is meant to or can be understood in a vacuum or by our own interpretations, just as this applies to words and verses in the text itself. So it applies to all aspects of the Torah. If we properly place the holiday of Yom HaTeruah in context, we see that it too does not occur in a vacuum. Rather, it is followed ten days later by Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. This explains why we are calling out to Yehovah to remember us on Yom HaTeruah in order that he may grant us atonement ten days later on Yom HaKippurim. So therefore, there is deep, deep meaning. And it's very, very important that we study these things because if you don't, you can make up whatever you want. And that's what a lot of people do, make up whatever rules and regulations they want. Pick and choose rules and regulations. We don't do that. We study the text carefully. And I suggest and recommend to all of you, brothers and sisters, to study, study, study. But not just study. Study carefully, carefully, in context, carefully, and really study hard to know the scripture well. Study the scripture well. Shalom.